Hi, uh, this is James O'Keefe. I'm uh, captain of the Massachusetts Pirate Party, and thank you for coming, joining us on this Pirate News episode. Uh, we have three topics to discuss today. Um, I'm joined by um, Eli, Steve, and Joe. How are the three of you? Well, I'm just peachy. Doing well. Thank you, Jamie. Doing good, too. Excellent. Um, so the topics that we have, we'll get to in a moment. Uh, first, on this Friday at noon, we'll be in front of the State House, where uh, Joe Onorowski, who's also joining us here, uh, is going to be handing in his signatures and other paperwork so he can be on the ballot for the 17th Middlesex District State Representative. So if you're interested in joining us uh, for that, we'll have a link in the description below. We'll meet at the State House steps at noon. Um, also, on the 15th of June, we'll be at the Boxborough Fifers Day, and we'll have a link to that if you wanted to join us. We'll have a table there and telling people about the Pirate Party and ways they can protect their privacy uh, online and not online. So those are our two big events coming up. Um, with that, uh, we can go to our first segment, which is namely, finally, the Federal Communications Commission uh, has re has changed their rules such that net neutrality rules will be enforced, namely that you cannot charge different tiers for different um, you, you can't, A, you can't treat any byte differently than any other byte. Um, so if you're getting a stream from uh, Netflix, for example, uh, or you're getting a stream from something provided by your cable company, your ISP, those cannot be treated differently. They can't throttle traffic coming from Netflix unless Netflix pays them money, for example. Um, and that also means that all the traffic that we get will be treated equally going forward. Of course, ISPs don't like that because they want to be able to discriminate against different traffic and make yet more money uh, off of us, which they're already making tons of money while providing us with substandard service compared to, oh, I don't know, the rest of the world. So uh, any thoughts, folks? I mean, isn't it like when all the ads became absolutely constant and outrageous right after they denied net neutrality? That's when all of a sudden it was like, ad, 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 ad. And that. Yeah, I think, um, you know, I, I think the federal, our federal government got it right with uh, the telephone lines, where, you know, the telephone lines were treated as common carriers and um, pretty much, you know, the regardless of what the phone company might have liked, and they did not like this. You know, whatever you wanted to do over the phone line, you could do over the phone line. And that included things, you know, that included, you know, talking, uh, you know, just normal voice calls. But it also included things like fax machines and modems in the early days of the Internet. And even, you know, later on, uh, DSL is, you know, a, a um, you know, a higher broad, a much higher broadband version of um, transmitting information over the phone lines. Now, with the Internet, the. Uh, our federal government does not qualify, you know, the internet is, you know, the telcos is common carriers. It's considered an information service. And, you know, every couple of years we have this back and forth, um, typically when there's a change in administration, <laughs> you know, you, uh, you know, you have, you either, uh, you know, you're either trying to fight to, um, you know, avoid losing what you had or your the next administration comes along and you're trying to claw it back um you know the i i think the the internet is 
you know, it's not quite as essential as electricity, but it's, it's close. It's close. There's, um, it's just required for, you know, in all practical purposes required for too many things. And, um, yeah, there should be a, you know, there should be a level kind of a level playing field and yeah, the ISPs don't like it, but you know, there's, there's balance in this, you know, and I, I think, um, you know, from the consumer side, uh, you know, a level playing field would be the right choice. Yeah. Well, just to, sorry, go sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, just to add to that, happy Mother's Day. Today, I was teaching my grandmother, bless her soul, she's in her mid to late 90s, had a video conference call, my mother. And, uh, you know, which is kind of funny because I know that she's going to be doing it all the time for my mother <laughs> at ridiculous hours. And so that uses data. And that's not considered like a normal phone line. And so if they can like throttle that and slow it down uh, or make her have to even worse, watch more ads just to do that, um, you know, if they can find some way to make more money off of and squeeze squeeze more, they're going to try. And, you know, we really need to put stringent laws in place to make sure they don't. You know, well, I know a lot of us feel like the internet is uh, is a right, and in a lot of ways has led to many freedoms across the world. You know, because once we start understanding and knowing and being able to find information when we need it, it's just it's a game changer. The only thing that I would add is we've spent, I believe, the figure is at least two hundred billion dollars in federal subsidies to internet service providers, cable companies, uh, ostensibly to bring, bring high-speed internet to everyone in the United States. And we still haven't done that. Um, and yet these companies have then taken the money, which e even recently we've, we've given them uh, an additional, I think, $50 billion. Um, that's just going out the door and in terms of stock buybacks, um, why are we subsidizing these companies when they're giving us a substandard product uh, where they want to be able to charge um, the services that we use more money uh, in order to reach their customers? You know, as, as Steve pointed out, common carriers works with the phone companies it should work here. So the next topic, um, Steve, can you give us an update about the MBTA? Yeah, and I'm going to start by prefacing this with um, you know a little backstory on something I've been reading in my copious free time, which is uh, MassDOT's long range planning report. Uh, so this this is sort of like the the state DOT's transportation. Uh, long-range transportation plan. They do this because, you know, every state has to have one of these. It's a, some sort of a federal requirement. But one of, so just, you know, the other piece of background information that you, you know, you need to know is that um, if you ask the internet, who has the worst traffic in the United States, um, you will f uncover yet another Boston-New York rivalry where, you know, the internet is split on um, you know, who is the worst, but we are definitely in the top two. <laughs> that much is clear. And, you know, for, you know, as part of, um, you know, sort of evolving our transit system, you know, our, the DOT realizes that uh, adding road capacity will not reduce congestion. Um, you know, just, you know, free roads and you just incentivize people to use them and you end up burning a burn, you know, people end up driving more transportation's our biggest source of greenhouse gases so they're actually focused on reducing vehicle miles traveled and you know trying to encourage other forms of transit um, you know this includes things like improving uh, access for pedestrians and cyclists but public transit is also a very big part of this enter the MBTA <laughs> Now, 
the MBTA, basically ever since the Romney administration, I, I think, yeah, I think the Romney administration, there's been, they've had funding challenges. And, you know, one of, I don't recall how the T was funded prior to that, but uh, basically Governor Romney switched the, you know, decided that part of the Massachusetts sales tax would, um, you know, would basically, you know, take care of the T's operations. And it's never lived up to that. Um, you know, in addition, we had the, you know, the T was required to take on, um, you know, debt for sort of like some of the mitigation projects from the big dig, uh, like the Green Line extension. So that basically, you know, had to, you know, they had to pay for that. Now this year, the T is looking at a uh, a six hundred million dollar gap in a three billion dollar budget, and we know what the we know what the we know that the, the underfunding has been a problem for uh, for a long time. Um, you know this has you know means that there aren't enough drivers. It also means that there is a huge maintenance backlog. Uh, and you know, people in the last year, you know, we've we've been starting to see that maintenance backlog catch up with us, and people are joking about, yeah, well, let's um, I'm gonna I'm gonna hop on a, a red line train, and my buddy's gonna hop on a bicycle, and we're gonna see who gets there first, <laughs> right? You know, normally this should not be a not be much of a contest, but um, you know, lately we've we've seen periods where the bicyclist wins by a long shot. We'll we'll just say that. So. Our governor realizes that you know this is um, that this is a problem, and so far with the you know the House budget, the governor's budget, and the Senate's budget, they don't even come close to closing that six hundred million dollar gap. So the governor Healy's budget has you know another one hundred seventy two million. The House budget has another two fifty seven. The Senate budget has one fifty seven. So it's it's somewhere around you know. You know, you, well, this is what you need to to operate. Well, we're going to give you a third to a half of that. Now, what the T is going to try to do, you know, this is you know, it's kind of the reality that they're de going to deal with. They're going to get through FY twenty five by burning through the reigning day fund, and basically trying to find um, another ninety three million dollars in cost savings. Um, this is a lousy situation to be in. Um, you know, there's, I, I do appreciate the fact that, you know, Massachusetts adopted a, you know, a quote unquote millionaire's tax. It's tax on income of over a million dollars. And that's for, uh, you know, transit and education and, and stuff like that. That hasn't come close to, uh, that hasn't been sufficient to closing the gap. Um, be, you know, there were, and we're kind of, I think, in a vicious cycle of, um, you know, where, the T, the reliability problems are discouraging people from riding the T, and you know ridership is another source of revenue. So they're they're dropping. You know we're losing money. They're you know basically losing out there. I mean ridership is uh, something like sixty four percent of what it was pre pandemic level. Uh, we have a secretary of transportation who wanted to like just take a, an uncensored look at. You know how to how to fund transportation projects, including the T. Um, you know, and that would in, that would involve things like you know, well, we sh maybe there should be tolls, you know, on highways other than the Mass Pike. You know, let's let's look at this. And our governor has shot that down. Um, so yeah, I, I'm, I'm concerned about the long term health of it, and you know, just the fact of you know, just the fact that. You know, we have a, we have, you know, a, an agency that really needs help. It provides a valuable resource. I mean, a, a necessary resource to a lot of people. And we also have a, a climate law that requires us to get to net zero uh, by, you know, basically reduce greenhouse gas emissions by, uh, 85 or 90 percent relative to 1990 levels, and we have to do this by 2050. And when transportation is the biggest source of greenhouse gases, and we there is so much we could do um, 
you know, to improve the state of public transit, active transportation, and that sort of thing. Um, this really seems like a um, being penny wise and pound foolish. Thoughts? I mean, Good job. reliability is one of the more key things that we have to get hammered in so that people have faith to take it. And it's been going this year for a while. I mean, I know this year that they were doing massive, massive upgrading and fixing. Do you know how that's coming along, or is it? Is it there? Slow? You know, there are. So one of the things that um, the challenges that he has had are quote, quote unquote slow zones. This is where, due to um, a maintenance, due to insufficient maintenance, uh, the track uh, it is not safe to drive to operate a train at normal speeds on certain sections of track. So they basically have to slow the trains way down, and that is, you know, that's getting better. Um, the T is not just the subway. The T is also uh, the bus lines. Um, you know, for example, Blue Hill Avenue in Boston, um, I believe the ridership on those bus routes is somewhere, a, a, it's close to what the Green Line carries on a given day. It's also the commuter rail and it's also ferry service. Um, you know, commute, there's, with the commuter rail, they, they are diesel trains. Um, you know, this is, they should be electrified. Electrified trains, not only do you have the you know, do you get rid of the emissions? But, you know, the electric motors are capable of accelerating faster. So you actually reduce trip times. Buses, buses are, buses are more difficult because one of the things that, you know, we've historically done is, well, the buses ride in the same congestion as every, as, as the rest of the traffic. Um, you know, you can have really efficient bus service, but you need infrastructure for it. Uh, things like bus, uh, dedicated bus lanes, uh, boarding islands, so that the bus isn't always having to pull off and fight its way back into traffic. Yeah, so there's, you know, there's some work, some of that work has to be done at a municipal level or at a state level. Um, but yeah, there's, there's, we have a lot, we have a lot of work to do. <laughs> One thing I'll add, um, I remember talking with someone in my extended family who was a state representative, uh, who I shall not name, uh, who was particularly proud of the fact that they limited the MBTA budget previously to these changes that were done, I believe in, if it was under Romney, it, you know, um, <clears throat> Uh, possibly under Romney, but essentially the MBTA would always exceed its whatever budget it had. And so the legislature would have to give them more money uh, at the end of the year. And this caused some consternation to, you know, uh, state representatives and state senators from the western part or the middle part of uh, Massachusetts, certainly from communities that don't have public transit. And so they set that such that the MBTA got the money it got and that was it. And so we've seen when you've got to balance your budget and you have less resources, well, you've got to take it out of some other place. And the way they've taken it out of is maintenance and, and updates to infrastructure, um, which were fine for a while, but, you know, eventually come and bite you. Absolutely. Um, so our last topic, uh, speaking of being bitten, uh, Joe, you had an update on steward healthcare. Okay. Yeah. So today we go from good to bad to worse. So steward healthcare is, uh, a large chain of hospitals. They have eight of which in spread across Massachusetts and um, they essentially did this, they, they're going bankrupt. They did this deal in order to expand really quickly and to kind of bit them in the, bit them in the keister. And so now they're filing bankruptcy, but no, 
in the very fact of when they filed the bankruptcy, they were still supposed to pay their employees, and they now have not. So, um, what's essentially going on is they'll probably end up getting bought out by another one of the other healthcare systems that we have going around. However, this is one of those deals where a company group too big and I'm hoping that they're not going to get bailed out. Um, I'm hoping that some other hospital system that doesn't, doesn't just try and use its investments as piggy banks. Um, but I guess I'm not really explaining this well, but essentially they're, they're a major hospital chain. They have 31 hospitals and one of the things about it is they made a deal where they sold their property in order to expand quickly and now they're not even being able to make payments to their property leases and it basically led to them having to file a chapter 11 bankruptcy but even when you file a chapter 11 bankruptcy you still have to pay your employees you still have to pay your um certain people including your rent and they're not even doing that you know so i'm very interested to see what this was what's going to become of this it's something that i want to bring to everyone's attention because it could be really bad in terms of putting even more burden on our already overburdened healthcare system and so and when you stop playing paying your healthcare employees they generally don't work for you very much longer after that. And so I'm expecting there to be a whole lot less jobs for those in the healthcare industry because you're going to have all these dis displaced workers. You're going to have these massive um, hospitals just shutting down. Uh, eight in Massachusetts, but 31 in total. And it's going to, we're going to probably see a ripple effect as this, congl this big conglomerate hospital chain just comes crashing down and like we we've seen it what happens when other major companies come crashing down but it's going to be a little different when it comes to a hot care system um for example imagine all of mass health just crashing it there's going to be a ripple effect in the industry and so typically something like this happening it's probably going to jack up prices for healthcare. it's going to cause problems for people being able to find health care longer wait times because people have to be redirected to other hospitals you know and the people who go to those hospitals are going to receive exceptionally substandard service um I, before we start recording jamie was telling me a story about how somebody actually got really sick, Jamie. Do you remember the story we were talking about? Yeah, I, I, I think we mentioned it in a previous episode. There, there was, uh, there was a woman who was at one of Steward Healthcare's um, facilities, and they didn't have the. They needed a particular set of equipment to save her and they didn't have it because that equipment had been repossessed due to lack of payment. So of course this is all alleged. Um, I'm sure the family is suing Stewart healthcare. Um, but it's just, you know, these decisions by private equity, uh, to maximize their profits at the expense of everyone else cost people lives and you know for we, we've seen this with you know Kari Doctor has long pointed out the whole as he terms it in shittification of tech but also where you have healthcare companies that are merging you have you know companies that make the beds and they make all these other things and everything's tied in and you literally can't use their equipment with other equipment. Um, and it's just a way of extracting profits. We have the most expensive healthcare system in the world with, 
with poor results. I mean, we have declining life expectancy in the United States, like no other uh, modern economy has that problem. None of the European countries do. Japan doesn't. <clears throat> and, and so we've got a system that is allowing a small number of people to get really rich while the rest of us get screwed. I mean, we have some of the highest mortality rates for expecting mothers, uh, some of the highest mortality rates for newborn infants. You know, I mean, you could end up going in and sprain, it, sprain your wrist and go in and end up dead with our healthcare system the way things are going. Now, obviously, I'm exaggerating a little bit on that one, but unfortunately, not that much. Uh, I mean, just a little bit with your health take a dire, or dire consequences with it and so this is not really something that we really need to be joking about. and really where we need to end up is a place where we can get good health care cheap and in a way that is better for everybody so, uh, i just i see there is a, a uh, I think we're losing Joe, unfortunately. <laughs> Thanks, Joe. Um, Steve, Eli, do you have thoughts on this issue? Sounds like a real mess. <laughs> other, other than that, you know, it's something I've been tangentially aware of, but... Um, yeah, this was this was a nice overview. So thank you, guys. Yeah, one thing we haven't talked about um, is, uh, yeah, Joe, you're lagging. Uh, it's more distorted. It's like you're down a well. <laughs> Sorry, Joe. Um, is you know we as part of the pandemic government assistance programs, they expanded Medicare. Um, and then they dropped the funding in the last, you know, they decided not to fully fund all the expansion. And so 30 million people, I think is the number, um, are in the process of, or have lost Medicare funding. You know, there have been stories of people showing up to it, showing up to the doctor's office. Uh, to get an appointment for their kid who has some, you know, serious ailment. And they're like, oh, yeah, we can't see you because we can't, you don't have insurance anymore. And it is amazing to me in this incredibly wealthy country, we, not, everyone doesn't have health insurance. Uh one of the things that happened with me as I came off of Mass Health and went into the working force was that Mass Health, where I had no income, um, and this is a, a kind of a, a staple problem, I have worse insurance now working than when I didn't have anything or I wa wasn't providing for myself or for those around me. And so it's also interesting how we have we have better health care for people who are not contributing to society than those who are contributing to society. And so um, that's also an issue. Whereas we could just have a simple health care system that literally is just good, robust, and everybody's contributing to a single pot in that way, we are all getting health care and we are all getting it. We under we already understand how this whole thing works. And if we're all just contributing to the same health care pool, then it would literally pay for everybody. We, we've already done the numbers for this. We already get how this works. So why not just give health care and dental and everything to everybody? And then all the people that contribute can just contribute into one giant pot. So that would be sensible, Joe. <laughs> I, 
I'll just point this out. Like in 2002, um, s- someone did research and they, f- they added up all the funding that was done by the federal government, state government for employees, for Medicare, Medicaid, whatever, um, as well as all the tax breaks we give for private health insurance. And they figured that just that public spending alone per capita was more than every other country spends on health care except Switzerland. And you know it's even worse than it was, and the care is even worse. So with that, um, thank you, uh, Eli, Joe, and Steve, for um, joining me at uh, today's Pirate News. And again, uh, this Friday the 17th, uh, we'll be out there with Joe showing support as he drops his signatures off. And um, we'll be at the Boxborough Fifers Day on June 15th. So with that, adieu. Have a wonderful week. Uh, enjoy the rain. Uh, hope everything is wonderful for you. And, you know, find us at masspirates.org. Uh, we'd love to see you in the future. With that... Thanks, folks. Thanks, guys. Take care. Have a good night.